I'm, uh, I'm uh, Rachel Shipley, or you would say Rachel Shipley. I'm from Orlando, Florida. Uh, and I, uh, we moved from Cleveland, Ohio, because my husband wanted to buy radio stations. So we came down to Orlando, oh, I think nigh on 30 years ago, uh, to uh, buy radio. We came with our four children. We have four kids, 14 months apart. I always wanted to have a large family. And that's a funny little story too. Uh, the house of Rothschild always fascinated me as a kid. And I'll never forget the one movie I saw years and years ago when I was a teenager. This was uh, about the fam family Rothschild. And uh, this was the old man with the three, four sons. And uh, they said, we are going to establish the house of Rothschild. One will go to Germany, one will go to France, and one will go to England, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, I, I went to the house of Shipley. And that's what I did. So we have four kids. 14 months apart, two boys, two girls, two blondes, two brunettes. And uh, that's the story of my family. And um, it's been a fun life so far. Okay, so how about telling us? Uh, you'll edit all this stuff. I'm just oh, yeah. giving you all this. No, I'm, I'm just rattling off keep and on, yeah. Keep rattling. Yeah, so I'll just rattle. Tell here. me when must speak, when it's enough, I'll stop. So, so let's talk about, let's, let, let's, go, let's start at the very beginning. Right. Tell us when you were born, what your birth name was, uh, what your family's name was, maybe a little bit of like, a little family history. Where my father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, that's... And what the, brought them together and things like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, let me see. As much as you know. As much as I know. As I said before, it's uh, Rachel Shipley, or in Israel they say Rachel Shipley, and uh, born in Philadelphia, one of five children, and I'm the middle child. There are four girls and one boy. And um, my grandparents came from Zhitomer, which is right outside of the, uh, which is now in the Ukraine, outside of Kiev. And they came over in the early 1900s. They uh, lived on a farm. Uh, my grandmother was the wealthy one of the family, and my grandfather was the Shiva Bucha. And her family had a little farm uh, in Jitomer. They had, uh, my grandmother had 13 children, which to me today is hard for even to believe. And, uh, the twin boys fell in a well and they died, and most of them died in those days. And the story with the family is how they came to, uh, uh, to America. Is the one, uh, of course, there were pogroms all over Russia. And uh, my grandmother um, was, in the, was in the fields, and uh, the, uh, there was a pogrom. And my mother uh, was seven, eight years old, but she still, and they came and they, they had torches uh, to burn. It's just like Fiddler on the Roof. It's the same, that setting, Fiddler was our family, with my grandma and the grandfather. And unbeknownst to this, she was a kid, and she said, well, and she was in the house at the time, so she hid in a closet, feeling that if the house burned, she would be safe. This was the the feeling of a child, and uh, it, she came out of it. it, was very sad. She lost half of her hearing, and she had many, many stories. And she never told us that until uh, when we got older, she told us a story about the program. My grandfather came to, the, uh, to Philadelphia uh, with his older daughter, Aunt Bessie, and my mother and uh, her brother and other sister stayed behind. And uh, my grandfather uh, was a shamus in the shul in Philadelphia. And then when he had enough money, he brought the, his wife and the kids, brought them to uh, Philadelphia. And it was a very interesting story how this thing evolved. Uh, he, uh, my grandmother was a businesswoman uh, and everyone really loved her. So I got bits of the story here and there were as, uh, uh, he, they had a, uh, she had a little grocery store. And in fact, it was uh, in a little boarding house. How they made their money, I don't know. How they were able to do this. Because these were questions. We ask questions now about everything. But in those days, you never asked about where your family came from and most of our history. So I'm doing this 
memory, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But all I know is that we always had a very, very close-knit family. And uh, we, um, my mother, <laughs> that's an interesting story. Uh, my mother, she came over in, when she was early teens. And of course, uh, she had, she couldn't go to school, although she always wanted, she, she was a learnaholic, she always wanted to learn. Didn't go to school, but she decided that, uh, so she wanted to work in the sweatshop. But she had a very close girlfriend, and uh, they went into this fancy schmancy restaurant where they had singing waiters. And that's how she met my father. My father was a singing waiter. waiter. And my father loved to, uh, his whole life was music. He loved to sing. So besides being a singing waiter and making some money here and there, he would get together with a group of all of the, uh, uh, the composers. And I don't know if anyone remember Mo Jaffe. He was a top uh, a songwriter. And this was the time of uh, Jolson and Eddie Cantor. And music was always a part of our life. How we got, I'm sure everyone is interested, how we got involved in show business, which is a, it was Bashert, I suppose. Uh, Mo would come to our house on a Sunday, no, a Saturday evening, right after Shabbat. And um, he said, okay, kids, sing something. And both uh, Evie and I, I was born Rose Goldman, and my sister uh, was, was Evie. And he says, okay, kids, uh, do you, you know this song? And of course, Music was always in our house. We were raised with Yiddish folk songs like Shane Vib de Bunna, Shay de la Belle, so it was very easy for us. And then he says, you know, you kids have natural harmony. And um, he said, you know, you kids are really good. And that going to show business, the last thing I ever wanted to do in my life. I and mean, this was something. When I went to the Philadelphia High School for Girls, uh, I said, I'm gonna be an archeologist or I will be in the diplomatic service. And show business, it was ridiculous. But uh, we worked our first, we were paid for our first singing event, I would say, at a bar mitzvah, uh, which my father was a real entrepreneur, and he belonged to a lodge. And we sang in bar mitzvahs, in bat mitzvahs, and weddings, and you name it. And uh, our first one that we sang, and they said, you know, your kids are really good. So that's really what started uh, our career in show business. It was just, it was, everything was so natural. Uh, Yiddish was so natural, because when my mother met my father, he didn't speak a word of Yiddish. He was born in uh, Baltimore, and uh, she didn't speak any English. And uh, when she finally, uh, he chased her, he wanted to marry her, and she said, you have to meet my mother and father. And uh, they met, came to the shul, and my grandparents lived on the third floor of the shul, and that's where they had their little living quarters. And uh, they looked at uh, my father and said, you're not Jewish, you're a Shagetz. So they wouldn't believe it. So my grandfather took out a siddur, and they said, read. And when he read, was able, that was his bar mitzvah speech, and be able to read. And then they finally believed, and they, they consented and they got married and uh, that's what started the, the beginning of uh, my tale, I would say, how we, where we came from. Uh, it's very hard to remember all the facts exactly. Can I just ask you a couple of questions before we move on? Am I babbling on? You have to edit no, all I, this no, stuff. There's, there's a couple of questions I have about what you're saying because I have a feeling that we're going to get away from it. And we are getting away from so, it. And so before we, uh, a couple of questions. One is, um, do you remember your grandparents' names? Yes. And as well, could you give us a little bit of a timeline when they when they came over, just and you know, and 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 where exactly they settled? Your father, I guess, is old settled in Baltimore. Yes, yes. But, so, or at least some. Of, so, could you just give us a little bit of, just of the details? So we have my grandmother uh, was uh, Rivka Friedman, and my grandfather was Yossi Friedman, uh, and my father was uh, uh, was he Herman Goldman. Uh, in Baltimore, and uh, his family came from, I believe, Poland. Um, and um, the time frame, I really don't really know. Just ask me. I'm giving you bits no. of information that I'm trying to. I'm, I, look, there's so his, much to his say about the. Were fr Friedman, and he was a Goldman. Yeah, he he was a, he was a Goldman, and his uh, par and my grandmother's were was Friedman. So I have no idea where to 
where the freedmen went to the gold mine. No, no, no. No, my, my, my father was Goldman, was Herman Goldman. That was my, that was my father, was Herman Goldman, born in Baltimore. His parents came from, the, uh, from Poland. My grandmother and grandfather was Yussi Friedman and Yussel Friedman, and my grandmother was Rivka Friedman. Is that the information that you want? Your father's father was a Goldman. Yes. But okay. your mother is a freedman. But my mother's a, thank you very gotcha. much. Okay. Your mother is a freedman. Okay. I, I, I'm not very bright, so I have You are friends. very bright, but I am, I would have preferred had my sister told you this story. She's much more accurate when it comes to okay. the facts. Can you just rephrase it, just say my father was a Goldman, my mother was a freedman. When they got married, then we became Goldmans, and then maybe a little bit about the story of Goldmans becoming... Oh, you're good. Um, ...whatever your, your stage name became. David, is that a good idea? Um, we, we go there. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we have the information at this point. No, so. you have the information. Uh, Lynn can go more into the detail. Right. You know, so right. I'd much rather so, so, grandmother, so. grandfather. A little interesting story, too, is when we started singing all the Yiddish songs, my grandmother and grandfather would take three trolley cars to come to where we were living in West Philadelphia. And the first thing my mother did is that Kinderlach, sing a song. So we used to sing our, our Yiddish song, Shane the Devona, Bishay to the Bells. And then my grandmother said, um, Teibel, die hast nachis von dein Kinder, ich hast nachis auf dir. I, I quell from you, but you quell from your children. And uh, my father had a beautiful voice. My mother sounded like Lily Pons. She had a very high soprano voice. So music was every part of our life. And then we were, we were rather orthodox, so we didn't have any radio on a Friday night or a Saturday. So we'd sing, or the whole family would sit, and we'd sing all Yiddish songs, and it was just a part. It was a part of our being. Every minute was always music with us, as, even as kids. So it was so natural that we should go into Yiddish theater. Is that? That's perfect. Is that pretty much So the, before we leave this part of your life, yes. I want to ask one more, one other question. And if you feel like there's something you want your sister to answer, that's fine, too. I, I just am so interested in this part of it. So you're telling me that uh, that you you guys were raised Orthodox and that you that the the, the Yiddish music was really was in our soul in, was in, the in, beginning. So the question I have for you is this: What was your American experience like back in those days, having the Orthodox on one side and yet you were living in America? Did, how did you how did you feel? We so lived with Jews. Everyone, every we were we were part of every place we lived. It was in a Jewish neighborhood, and it was uh, we never even questioned it. Uh, we the only time uh, we didn't go to Hebrew school, we didn't have to because we we lived very Jewishly. Pesach, we had two sets of dishes, and we went down to the basement. To that's the part, and we in that way we were in Shlokapuz in Yom Kippur. My grand, my father took a a chicken, doing that. Uh, you know, so that part because of our grandparents that we were and we lived many times, very close with them through the years. So therefore, uh, it was a natural thing. We never thought of, we're, there's never a separation being an American or being a Jew. It was a part of, even though there was a lot of anti-Semitism, which we knew, you know, at that time as well. And uh, that's the, uh, does that answer your question? Completely. I think you want to answer that question too, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to you. To you me. had your chance of going first. Yeah, but, and that's no, 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 just it. And you take which version you want, but I, want, I just, that, I that's both. pretty much, but that's pretty versions. much they're the... Both, they're both the right version. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about, uh, so you started singing and in, in, uh, you started singing around the table around Friday nights and things like that. And the, it was Saul came over after, well, that was his name, right? He would come over uh, after no. services and... and uh, no. My water. Not really quite. Uh, that Lynn will have her version. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the early career. How we got into English. Okay. And please edit every part of it because oh, I'm trying to remember and to, and to, and I, I just babble on. Okay. I, the babbling is what I want. Okay, I'll babble and you'll take the selected parts, so which I'd be very happy. My father was always uh, spent a lot of time with songwriters and this Mo Jaffe who wrote uh, The Glory of Love. He uh, came. He used to come to our house on a Saturday night, and uh, my mother used to make. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, she bought in. Uh, what did she do? 
she used to make uh, salami and corned beef, and he would sit at the, we had a little upright piano, and he would be eating the salami sandwiches, what, and then we would start singing, and it was just a part, it was so natural. You know, we didn't go out on the weekend, and it was always music. We had music in our house all the time. We never even really had a book, we never had a newspaper. To be honest, we had Yiddish newspaper, we had Yiddish books, but we never really, in the early years, was always music. And my father always brought uh, sheet music from Tin Pan Alley, you know, so it wasn't, he was, the, he was the American part, and my mother and my grandparents were the Yiddish part. And for some reason, it melted, the whole thing, it became one. So we're a potpourri of, uh, of Yiddish. So there's no separation for being Jewish or being an American or, and all that. And we were so proud of what we were, and we are still to this day. So that's the early part of my life. That uh, then, uh, in, after, during the, the, first, the Second World War, okay, uh, uh, when the, the first stage door canteen was in the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. That was when the war started. So um, uh, I went down there, and brought uh, my sisters, my, my, my uh, uh, not only Lynn, but my two sisters and the four of us were hostesses at the States Door Canteen. And if you recall, in Philadelphia had the Naval, they had the Naval uh, uh, Academy and that's where all the soldiers would come in, the sailors would come in, the French and the Australians and uh, from South America and all of a sudden, the world opened up to both, to Lynn and myself. Oh my God, there's a world out there. We have, uh, and this was, and we were very active during the war. And then we used to go to the Naval Hospital and we brought my mother and my father. And my mother would make her special cake and we would go to uh, go in the hospital in all the wards and we'd bring cake and uh, my father would come. So it was a whole golden family. We we're very active, uh, just going to the canteen. And it was just, it was something we never thought about. And then there was one blind uh, Marine who we liked very much, Ray Raymond. And we brought him home uh, for the weekend. And then we, the paraplegics, we just were a part of that life. And that gave us a, a feeling of the world. You know, that's what say, hey, it's more than Philadelphia, it's more than America. The world is out there. And I think that really affected me more than anything else. And say, I want to be an Indiana Jones. I want to see the world. Nothing was enough. I just don't want to stay in one place. And that, lets on, that leads on to the rest of, of uh, my life after, uh, I let, after Lynn and I, you know, I went my way, she went her way. But I think something would kind of interest you is that I went to the Philadelphia High School for Girls. I, was way, I had to wait a year before uh, Lynn got out of high school. So um, I looked at the newspaper and I said, I got to get a job. So I saw an ad, MGM uh, distribu Distribution, distributor in Arch Street in Philadelphia. So I went up there, I have a chutzpah, and to me, I never think of what's going to happen. So I walked in and I got a job. My first job ever was a billing clerk for MGM. You have to know, I never typed. I had the, I had the academic course. I didn't know how to take shorthand. I didn't know. Anyway, so I had that for six months, and for some reason, everybody liked me. I smiled a lot, and uh, they would help me out. But uh, what I did to that billing, I, the, whole, the, the whole system was totally at whack, but I got away with six months. And then the, Matt, um, Bob Lynch was the president of MGM. And his secretary came to me. At the, my name was Rose Goldman. She said, Rose, she said, do you know how to type? I said, sure. Do you know how to take short? Sure. She said, I've got to go to the hospital tomorrow. I'll be away for a month. Can you take over my job as an executive secretary? Can you? I said, sure. I had no idea. And what I would do is I'd come into... Lynch's office, uh, and I crossed my legs, and I took longhand. He thought I did shorthand. Then I went and go out, and I had my friends who would type it for me. So for another week or so, I faked it. Then uh, one day, uh, Bob Lynch said, uh, Rose, would you like to come for lunch? Dudley Wilkinson is coming from, uh, from MGM in, uh, in, uh, in L.A., so I said, fine. So I sat and we went to have lunch and I didn't say one word and I listened. And then we came back to the office. And then uh, 
Dudley said, I said, you know, Mr. Lynch, uh, I said, um, no, let's scratch that part out. No, Mr. Wilkinson, you have a problem. He said, what do you mean I have a problem, Rose? I said, you go all around the country looking for talented people. The, the best singing team in the country is right in, in Philadelphia. I said, who's that? I said, uh, the Gordon sisters. I took the name of my sister, who was uh, uh, Rochelle Gordon. So I said, why don't you give us a screen test? So he started to laugh. I said, we're really good, because I was so quiet at lunch. And he then, who is this kid? So anyway, I came back and I said, you know, Ev, I said, uh, we're going to get a screen test. So she said, forget about it. Um, two months later, I got a letter, which I still have, from Dudley Wilkinson. Kids, since you're the best singing team in the country, you have a screen test. Come to New York at a certain time, certain place, and you're going to get your tests. Well, <laughs> anyway, I told my poor sister Lynn. So she says, what have you got? I said, Don't, they'll take care of it. They're giving us the tests. We're good. I always believed in what we were and what we weren't. So, um, but she said, we have no music. Well, my sister, um, Rochelle Gordon, she was very, very talented. And she had, uh, she worked with this one top booking agent, uh, which was a Stan Zucker agency in New York, I think it was on Park Avenue. And he had one of the other agents, Leo Kahn, who was uh, a pianist. And uh, so she asked him, would you play for my sisters? So anyway, he said, fine. So I, to this day, I have no idea what we did for that screen test. And I, I always ask Lynn, and she, she, she doesn't remember either. Anyway, so uh, we finished, and then we're waiting out in the lobby, and they say, okay, George Ganks wants to see you. He was the head of the Skank brothers. One was in L.A., and George Skank was in, it was Joe and George Skank. And uh, he said, okay, kids, he says, come in my office. We walked into this office. I never saw anything as big as this. He was sitting at this desk, and he had a big cigar, and his legs were on the desk. He says, okay, kids, how much, he says, how much experience have you had? So he says, a lot. He says, please. He said, look, you're not a Judy Garland. He said, you don't have, I said, but you're two nice, sweet Jewish kids, and you have this possibility. I'll tell you what I'll offer you. I've got two propositions. He said, and you got to picture this. <laughs> two kids that didn't know anything. But we said, why not? And so he said, okay. He said, I'll send you out to Hollywood, give you $75 uh, uh, a week, uh, but we own you. He said, and we'll make stars out of you. But if we want you to be fat, you'll be fat. If you want to be skinny, you'll be skinny. If, you want, if your hair has to be purple, fine. But whatever we do, then you, we own you. And I said, Mr. Skank, what is the second suggestion? He said, work all the joints, go all over the country, work the nightclubs, and come back to me in, in two years. I, so I got up. This is thing. Nobody owns us. I said, we're, gonna, we're good. We'll be back in two years, and then you can make stars out of us. And then, anyway. I still remember that to this day. And my sister Lynn is looking at me, and she said, what are you doing? We came, <laughs> this is really so funny. So we came out into the lobby and I said, well, there went the screen test. Why are we here? And then Leo Khan said, look, kids, he says, you're really good. He said, you come with me. He said, you're coming to my agency. So he took us to the Stan Zucker agency and uh, he uh, walked into uh, Stan's office. He says, you know, Stan, these kids are great. Do you know that Skank offered them a Hollywood contract and they refused it? He wants them to go around the country and uh, uh, get experience. They want to see them back again. So anyway, and this is another thing with their life. It's been by shirt. So I'll never forget Stan Zucker. He said, you know, there's an opening in Fall River, Massachusetts. It's in a month. He says, okay. He says, uh, would you like to, to do, and he didn't even know that we never even did this in our lives before. So he said, you'll do two shows. It's the Highway Casino in Fall River, Massachusetts. And uh, I said, where's the contract? <laughs> so he said, don't pay for transportation and you do your own room and board. I said, okay. But this was our first offer for a job. 
which was rather exciting. And uh, I walked out and then I signed the contract and uh, Lynn looked at me and she says, we don't have any music, uh, we don't have any gowns. I said, don't worry, we'll get it, we'll get it. So came back and my sisters, uh, this sounds so outrageous, but this really did happen. And my sister got us her arranger, uh, which was Lou Dobbs and at Cavis, but we got two sets of gowns. And uh, my mother said, you kids are not gonna go by yourself. So her older sister, Dorothy, she was her manager. And uh, of course, uh, so we took a bus to Fall River, Massachusetts. And this was in the winter time and it was so cold. We go into this nightclub, which was totally the biggest thing we ever seen in our lives. The stage was 50 feet wide, 50 long, with 50 wide. And uh, we come into this place and there were two strippers on the bill. bill. They had an eight piece orchestra and they had a comedian. And uh, we did, by that time we had our music and we rehearsed. And uh, but one thing, Lynn is a perfectionist. And she killed me. And we had to, every time we looked at each other, we had it, we sang, even on the bus we sang constantly. And when we were there, and then the owner of the, uh, the Highway Casino was Johnny Costco, and a mafia, this is a mafia. Uh, and uh, he said, and he was, looked at us and he says, kids, do you know a Yiddish mama? So I said, yes, because we had all these Yiddish songs. We know. He said, okay, he said, I'll tell you what you do. After the show, I want you to sing a Yiddish mama for me. Do it every night. He held us over for four weeks. And um, after that, he said, uh, uh, where are you gonna be going afterwards? I said, well, we don't have a booking. He says, don't worry, I'll take care of you. And he was really our godfather. And he got us to the uh, uh, Dothan, Alabama, all the, the, the mafia gambling joints we worked in Dothan, Alabama, and also in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, that's what really started our career. There's another funny incident. Since um, at that time, uh, we decided that we wanted to, uh, we had to make money. And uh, we would go into New York uh, once, once a week. Uh, Lynn will tell you much about that, that part of the story. But there's one cute mafia story that could rather institute. In uh, 47th, in, uh, off of Broadway, there was this very famous Italian restaurant called Patsy's. And they had another restaurant, Patsy the Elder had one in New Jersey. So uh, they, uh, we, so they, we did one, uh, we did a show there. And then uh, I loved, uh, then he said, okay, Carol. But that time our name was Carol and Lynn Burton. And he said, no, Carol, I said, I said you, let me show you how I love, I love to cook. I said, he said, why don't you come down? And, and of course, the, the, I'm just trying to think. So they had the kitchens in the basement. And he said, uh, I said, well, give me the recipe. He says, I'll do it for you. So he made special pasta for us. Kept us there until five o'clock in the morning. We were afraid to even to say, no, we gotta go home. We'd always come home at a decent hour. It, what, we didn't take the cattle train back to Philadelphia until the, we got there at five o'clock in the morning. My mother had a heart attack and my sister and two little Jewish girls, what are you doing in a mafia restaurant? Why are you happy? So that was part of the funny part of our life, which prepared us with a lot of things that we've done uh, in, in the future. And then of course, what we would do is um, once a week, we would uh, go into New York and to see all of the, uh, the agents because we had to be able, we knew that the Borscht Belt was the venue for everybody. Everyone worked the Borscht Belt. We would make more doing triples uh, on a Friday, Saturday night in the Borscht Belt than you would ever do for a whole week when uh, you work any of the nightclubs. So, uh, and what I would do is uh, uh, get the list of the agents make the appointment and we take the cattle train into New York and we'd see all the agents and that's how we got started uh, working all the Catskills and then most of the owners had uh, hotels in Lakewood, New Jersey. So we would work Lakewood and then we'd work the Borscht Belt which was, which was a world within itself. 
and slowly that's what was part that's how it started our career and in the meantime since we had such a uh, background with Yiddish uh, my the one paper that I old magazine that I always read was Variety or Cashbox and I saw an article uh, on about uh, Banner Records that was the first Yiddish recording company uh, that they had years and years started in the uh, the forties. So once again, when we're in New York, we walked into Banner Records, and uh, we met the Seymour Rothschild. Seymour Rothschild was the Frank Sinatra of Yiddish theater. There's a tremendous background on on Seymour, and uh, he. Uh, had a gorgeous voice, and he said, okay, kids, he said, um, do you do Yiddish? I said, of course. He said, sing something for me. So we did Shevi de la Vona, we did the Shades of the Bells, and uh, he started our career in Yiddish theater. And after that, he got us the booking agents in uh, Montreal, in, in Canada, this Roy Cooper, at that time, was a, uh, he booked everything in Ottawa, Montreal, and uh, Quebec. And uh, uh, that's how we started, uh, our, we spent the winter time instead of being in Vegas. We we're always up in, in Canada, and that's what started our career with uh, with our uh, RCA record. I know I'm babbling on, but it, just a couple things. Yes. Could you tell us? So I know that My Yiddish Mama was the song you did last, but could you kind of tell us what the set was like besides that song? And also, could you kind of explain why you all of a sudden were the Burton sisters? So. Well. We worked uh, the Catskills, and there was an agent that uh, this, uh, I think it was uh, George Brent, he, and uh, we sang, and he says, you know, your kids are really good. He says, but the Gordon sisters is not a name for you. You need something. It's too Jewish. You need something that's worth it. So there was a bottle of um, a liquor on his desk, and uh, it was Gallagher and Burton. So thank God we were the Burton sisters, not the Gallagher sisters. And that was the story of the Burton sisters. So we won from Rose and Evelyn Goldman to uh, Carol, uh, to uh, the Gordon sisters in the Highway Sassino. And then it ended up with uh, the Burton sisters. And that's what our, not our final name, but that was our last name, I would suppose. Is that and, right? and what was your set? What was, you know, so you did get, you, when, when, when? We bought the Highway Casino. You know, you were telling me how the, the man wanted you to sing My Yiddish Mama, and then he held you over, but you said that you'd already had a set, and he asked you to do Well, that we after. had two sets. We had eight songs, and we had uh, things like, uh, we started with the Cumbachero, which is Spanish. We did a lot of languages. Uh, and then we we take a an opener. Uh, You're gonna, we're gonna live until you die. All the different songs, there was an English song. Then you remember that. And also, it was uh, I'm just what we did, and we did a ballad uh, like Autumn Leaves. We did that in English, and we did it in French because we were very good with languages. And then we, then the third was Chazan uh, Shabbos, which was a Yiddish. But we always took Yiddish songs, and this is what we got the translation with Sima Railside. He had all of the Yiddish artists that sang, and he was a, his wife, Miriam Crescent, she translated everything, American songs like Jilted, Hernando's Hideaway, uh, I Love Capri, they did that in Yiddish, and as well as in English. And that was always when we did the mountains, that's what we did, we did the English. When we, we worked the clubs, when we were in Canada, we did the Esquire Club in Montreal, and that's when we did, uh, we did mostly English, and then, uh, then we did some Yiddish. When we were in Canada, we did French. It was, it was there. And then every day we used to drive from Philadelphia to Kent, twelve hours, from Philly to uh, Montreal to Montreal, and we sang all the way. It was not. And we, every time we never really talked that much. We every, we every song we sang, we had a repertoire of five hundred songs, so we're able to. So it was, it was, you know what it is, it was a part of our life, you know. It was like breathing to us, eating to us, and that was a part. It started with Yiddish, and then we did French. And uh, one time that my poor sister, we worked in Quebec, it was uh, Quebec City, and the Port Saint-Jean, in New and uh, the, it was, they wanted a French act, and they wanted some Yiddish. And then the, uh, the owner said, you know, we have a problem. We don't have an MC. 
So I said, oh, no problem. I said, Lynn speaks fluent French. I said, she'll be the French. Well, that time my sister wanted to kill me. The one time in my life my sister wanted to kill me. Can you sing in Chinese? Sure, Lynn can do it. Lynn was, could do anything. So that's the reason my sister, to this day, even doing this, is a nervous wreck. Sure, we can do that. What do you want to sing it? That was a part of our life, and that was the fun part. But uh, I, that's the reason we have this relationship. A total understanding of what I always knew what she could do and I always knew what I can do and that's the reason and I think our relationship is to this day is that uh, we there's we're so different in with uh, our talents or so to me I PR was always been I would still do that today adventure PR has always been very easy for me and uh, Lynn has always been very very creative and uh, so therefore, we had a wonderful arrangement. This was our love relationship with each other, but still today. That's what awesome. are the, what, That's I know, I'm just babbling on, but I don't know what you're going to be getting you from this. stop, because this is all good. I mean, no, don't stop babbling. Stop worrying about babbling, because right. this is perfect. So I'm just going to keep leading you on, though. I Would you do that? Yeah. Because I want you to understand, because right now... Uh, Lynn, are, are, are you okay with everything over there? You're, you're getting yourself ready, but... You... Oh, no, it's just fine. I, I have some uh, memories. Selected. Oh, that's a selective memory. She has the memory. <laughs> I have well, a well, I can't different wait. Story. I can't wait. <laughs> okay, so um, we are at the stage right now where you're just beginning. You're doing the cat skills. You got in touch with this record company. Yes, yeah, so when we got a we got a banner, we had a, 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 a contract with doing Yiddish. And Seymour Real Site was really our... Uh, uh, our our godfather, and we we traveled the country with you to shows like the Borscht Capades, which was the big thing. Uh, you had uh, Mickey Katz, and you had some of the uh, the uh, you had the Barry sisters in uh, in in, in uh, New York too. But we were the one act that we can we do Yiddish. We had a Yiddish contract, and then ah, looked at uh, Variety. And I saw the article, Bob Merrill, who wrote Funny Girl, and Doggy in the Window, and uh, Mary the K in New York. He was a top uh, disc jockey with the Hush Puppies and all that. And they started a management company. So I saw where their offices were. So uh, at that time, we, were, we had a demo record. Because what we would do when we come into New York, we practically lived in the Brill Building. And uh, in those days, it was like the Tin Pan Alley. And uh, we would go from uh, one, uh, one floor to the other and doing the different songs. And we met this wonderful, very talented writer, this Bernie Wiseman, uh, who really took a shine to us. And he says, you know, uh, you kids, it was just like we the Tin Pan Alley, we sat at the piano. He says, you kids are really good. You should make a demo. What did we know from a demo record? So he got us into a studio. And uh, he coached us. And one, uh, we when we were in uh, when we were in Canada and we were at, uh, in Quebec, we loved the uh, French folk songs. They were just they were wonderful. And we found one, a si mon moin de la danse, and we said uh, we just loved the sound of it. So we came back, and uh, we sang it for Bernie. He says, you know, let's do a demo on that. And he did a couple of like uh, waters of the Minnetonka because we did have perfect harmony, and so he had, we had at least something to show. He wanted a record contract at that day. Get a record contract and you're made. And you'll see all the disc jockeys around the country and so forth. So anyway, so uh, when we walked up, we walked into Merrill's office, and we said hi. I said we're the Burton sisters. So they said, I said, do you have a de you have a demo? Yeah, and we played the demo of the of uh, the song. And he said, uh, now this is good, this needs English lyrics. So he said, um, I like your voice, we'd like to manage you. So I said, uh-uh, if you get us a contract recording, you can manage us, get us a record contract. He said, well, I'm with um, RCA and uh, Columbia. So uh, he played it for uh, uh, Joe Reisman, the R the a and r man at uh, you know, at RCA, and uh, he came back, we came back a week later, and he says, you kids have an RCA contract. He said, but what I'm gonna do, I wanna take this French folk song, and uh, I'm gonna write lyrics to it. 
and that's what started the. Then he put. Then uh, uh, we signed an agreement with him, and uh, we went to Webster Hall at that time, and they had uh, a full orchestra, and uh, he did. Uh, we did doing the French Can Can, and we did a Divided Love, and, and many. We had two or three different sessions, so we were the only sister team at that time that had a, a Yiddish recording contact and also uh, an RCA. And then uh, they thought that the, the French Can Can would be our hit record. So RCA sent us around the country on a two-week DJ tour. And that's the second part of our life. So we came to, um, we were booked in Cleveland was Bill Randall at the time was a top DJ. That was many, we're talking uh, 40, 50 years ago. We're talking in the 50s. And uh, so that was the one, we had to go to uh, uh, Detroit, Boston, uh, and there, and also uh, uh, we did mostly the East Coast. And uh, we had our little uh, 45 demo record. And uh, we were scheduled, this is a funny part of our life. Uh, went to uh, to Cleveland. Now, at that time, my husband was uh, he was um, uh, this was the Korean with the first Korean War, but Jim was a child star when he was uh, 15, 16 years old. WC, uh, CAU in Philadelphia. So he was uh, he did uh, uh, he's a how are, he's a storyteller. He's a uh, Tremendous actor, and he was uh, he was there every single week and so forth. So I don't know where I'm going into that part, but anyway, he's had his own theatrical background, but he's a writer, and he was able to create shows. So when he went to, uh, he decided to to uh, enlist uh, in the Coast Guard. He didn't want to be in the army. He said, no, he wants to have a clean bed. He says, I want to make life easier. So he, he they sent him out to uh, to um, where was it? Uh, I think to Oregon, I'm not, no, to Seattle. And he produced a few shows for them. So that was his stint uh, with, and he's another very interesting, talented man. So I did marry a very talented guy. But he finished his, uh, his, his year there, and then he came back to, uh, to Cleveland. And uh, it was another thing with Bashirt, I would say. His father was the RCA distributor mainline in Ohio. They had 400 distributorships all over Ohio. They also was the, the Whirlpool distributor. And his father was a, a real diamond in the rock, brilliant businessman. But Jim never wanted to go into his father's business. But another thing with Bashert, he came back to Cleveland. That was the week that we were scheduled to uh, do a DJ tour in, uh, in Cleveland. And uh, in the meantime, his father, and he started his own little, he wanted to go into advertising. So his father said, look, I had Ed Bang is a top sports writer uh, in Cleveland, his 75th birthday, get me a star, get me an act. Well, in those days they didn't do that. They couldn't get Como, couldn't get Sinatra, they couldn't get the, the biggies. So uh, Jim contacted RCA and he said, you know, he said, uh, do you have any new acts? He said, well, the hottest team in show business, we just signed, the Burton sisters. So he came to see his father. He says, Dad, I couldn't get the stars, but this is the hottest team in the business, the Burton sisters. My father-in-law looked at him and said, who the hell are the Burton sisters? A year later, I was his son, I was his uh, daughter-in-law. This is how the bus shared. So that was pretty much a part of my life in show business. And then Jim pursued us, and he followed us all over the country. We, uh, wherever we had to, we sang in Canada. So Jim was there, and uh, I wasn't quite ready to get married because that was just the time of our lives where our career was really booming and so forth. And that's the next part of my story. Yes. Couple questions. So in this day and age, you could have two recording contracts. One oh, yeah. for Yiddish record label. Didn't one bother. For no, fine. One enhanced the other. We're the only team that had that. There were other sister teams. But of course, it didn't. It didn't conflict, and even in, the, it was a different world then. So what? what if, in those days, you can have a Yiddish contract. You can have an American. You can have an RCA, and that only enhanced us as a sister team. 
In fact, uh, we used to come in once, uh, uh, once a week on a Sunday. Uh, once again, Seymour Real Sight got us a WMGM in, uh, in New York, and we used to come every, every week, and we used to go, and we had an hour show. And we'd bring in, the, and then we had Abel Stein, which was the, the most prolific uh, Yiddish songwriter and orchestra leader, and we had a 30-piece orchestra in the studio. And we brought my mother and father all the time came with us, and that's when they fell. The bird, we made it. When we had that Yiddish show, didn't care about an RCA contract, we really made it at the time. And uh, then I'll never forget, uh, I think it was the 10th or 15th, and we come into the lobby, and these are many people, little old people from all over New York, from Coney Island, from the Bronx, and they all came to see our show. And they could not believe that, uh, and my parents could not believe that they came to hear my kinderlach, my two kids. This was a part of the life. And that's when, as far as my parents are concerned, we made it. They didn't care about that. And it was really something. And what we'd do, we'd have like Edie Gourmet and Steve Lawrence, and you had Moisha Oisher. You had your top uh, stars come, and we'd sing together. In fact, uh, we have, uh, they, they taped all of our shows. So I believe I gave the, we have a 21 songs that we did that, that was taken from our radio show with a full orchestra. And uh, it was just, things happened to us so differently than when most kids. We never, we just, there, if there was something was out there, we would do it. And it was a very eclectic life that we lived. And when I think about it, I said, how did we do all this? But you never do. In those days, one thing led to another. And I think the biggest thing, I believed in my sister's talent. My sister could do anything. And my, and my sister Lynn said, well, what are you gonna do next? And, uh, and I always went out there. So we made, uh, we made a great team and there was never ever any jealousies between us because we, that was our relationship. So let me ask you another question and if you, uh, tell me if, if, if I'm, I'm digging too deep here about no. the Borscht Belt. Um, I'm fascinated with the Borscht Belt. Mm. I think it's an, it was an amazing community and it seemed like a place where a lot of art got, you know, mixed up and people got to talk and things like that. And you're this young, a new entertainer who's getting thrown into it. It's multi-generational as well. Of course. Of course. So could you just tell us a little bit about Borscht Belt and maybe some of the, if you have any people that you remember, even people who never even heard of before that happened to have been hangers on and things like that about the Borscht Belt or what, 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 what are your... Well, we, all the acts used to meet at 1650 Broadway. And that's where, you know, we, that's where Charlie Rapp was the top uh, talent agency. And they had the, and, uh, and we would go up to, never to forget, take Route 17 and go up. And then we went into Monticello. We went into uh, to Liberty. And uh, that's when we all, all of us had, uh, we, we did doubles or we did triples. And uh, that was another world, but everyone did it. Red Buttons did it, Sinatra did it. All of the young acts in Mel Torme did it, and you had uh, Alan King, all the comics, and it was a way of life. The Borscht Belt was another world, and that's, we made more just doing a weekend than we would ever do it, doing it in a nightclub. And, uh, and then they had, a lot of these hotel owners had uh, hotels in Lakewood, so we'd work the Lakewood circuit, and then we'd also work the, uh, the, the, the Cascals, and we did the, uh, the Concord, we did Grossinger's, but we did the little, the little ones. There were 500 hotels at that time. So you can imagine what it was like. It was another world. And uh, Lynn can tell you some very funny stories about our experiences, but that's a book within itself. And Stubby Kay, who did uh, Guys and Dolls, uh, and so many other stars today, uh, they all did it. Was there competition within the, the musicians of the Borscht Belt, or was it, did it seem like it was a, a common? Well, there's always, they, were, they all had, everyone had their own little band. It was never, a, they had, all the hotels had a social director, and they, which was the MC, and then they had the, the little, the, then they had the shows. We did two shows, and uh, then you had something called the Cochelains. Now, do you know what the Cochelain, at Cochelain, means cooking alone. They had these little cottages that 
uh, the women would come, the husbands would join them on a weekend, and they would do their own cooking, and they'd sleep there, and then they were not allowed to go into the hotel. If they wanted to go, they had to pay to be able to hear the entertainment. And that is, it was a way of life. Does that answer your question? Yes, and, 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 and I want to get to the next stage, but the one last question I have about that is the Catskills. You performed a lot in the Catskills. That was the mecca at that point in time. What, would, what, what was your feeling when you first went there? and what, How did you feel about playing there? You know, you never think about it. It was a matter, it was so, we, they wanted Yiddish, of course. That was the Yiddish and English. And we were a crossover between, so it was, it didn't matter uh, what we did. The feeling that we had, it was hard work to drive. Some took two, three hours to drive from New York. First, we came in from Philadelphia. Uh, we never, we never wanted to spend money on a hotel because what we did at those days, we always wanted to give money to our family, you know, mother and father, you know, who needed it. And so we never really stayed in New York if we did uh, we were overnight, like we did, we stayed at the Chesterfield, which is in 40, I don't know if it's still there today, 40, uh, 49th Street right off of Broadway. That's when we'd stay overnight. And then we'd go there. It was like going to a job. And then after Nothing the show. Nothing different, it was just any other yeah, job. Yeah, but the fun thing was after the show, we'd all meet at a restaurant in full, whether it's uh, whether it was a Monticello or Libertyville, and that's when all the ca the comics, that's something that uh, you never ha have it today. And all the comics would stand around the table, and we used to all order something. And uh, if it wasn't too late, because we always had to go back to Philadelphia. So it was a different way of life. It, it was, you're a part of a society. It was the Caskill Society. And you can work gross singers, and you can work these little tiny little, uh, uh, and, little hotels that, uh, but didn't matter. They all paid you the same, unless you were a star. So it was a, that's something which is really, in fact, uh, my husband, he, when I finally uh, met my husband, and he said, when he went to the crowd schools with us for the uh, last time for my husband, he couldn't believe, you know, what is it? You're, you're driving at night, it's so dark, and you're into, they don't, they're no, there's just roads there. It's amazing we didn't get killed. One time we drove with Buddy Hackett, who was absolutely insane. Buddy Hackett drove like a maniac, and Lynn and I are in the back, and I don't know how we came there alive, and he didn't really care, you know, we, but we arrived there. But you had these different experiences. That was, that was scary, more scary than singing at the hotel, the way you, and we always, we would never drive ourselves. We'd have the other acts drive for us. And it was, it was a way of life, simply a way of life. Wonderful. So, next phase, you had the one demo record for yes. RCA. Right. I think that's where we left off. We, um, so, or maybe it's a little bit of a mixture, but so. We had the demo records. Uh, we did uh, three, two or three sessions with RCA. We went into Webster Hall and we did uh, we did our session, we did uh, Two La La Lamas, we did Undis Divided Love, we did a series of, uh, they picked out, RCA picked out our songs for us. Do you, you know, know who was in the session by any chance, Produced it behind the board, or any musicians? Or uh, not really. Uh, we, the PR person was, Bern, was, uh, was Bernie, and then we had uh, uh, Hugo Wilter, uh, Winterhalter, he did, Reisman was, uh, did most of our thing. I'll never forget the Mary of the Cough was totally crazy. He was really a crazy disc jockey. And when we did Doing the French Can Can, and what they did, they promoted it with two poodles. And he had two poodles there while we were doing the doing. He, he was a PR person, you know. And uh, we, that's, he did our PR and so forth. So it was really interesting. Bob Merrill uh, was the, uh, picked our songs, and uh, Mary did the PR for us. They say that um, you are what people perceive you are. As simple as that. And if you look at yourself, you can do it. You can do anything. It, there's no barriers. And we never, we love challenges. And we never even thought about it. It was just, it was a way of life. I have a question. Right, he came about the Beatles in America. Oh. He's a big, big guy. I'm so curious in your business acumen without a lot of formal training. Your 
your love of challenges, I'd love for you to just tell us about, like, where do you think that comes from? Is that, well, let me just... And maybe I, I leave it out. Okay. Question. That's, well... Where did, where, did Chutzpah, where did it come from? Who knows? All I knew that I was different than anyone in my family. Uh, I, was, I was a loner, uh, and uh, I, I chose to go to the Philadelphia High School for girls. I never had a friend. I never, I, I really, and I'll never forget one thing that I still remember to this day. I would, never, I would go up to the roof garden of the, of the high school, and I would always bring my lunch by myself. And one time, I just looked at the skyline, and I saw the city hall and the uh, Enquirer building. And lots of times, you talk to yourself. And I said to myself, you know, you're different than anyone else. I'm going to do something in this world. And I never, never want to be like anyone else. And I think that that was a very important moment in my life where I felt that, uh, and I knew I wasn't, popular, and I knew I didn't have that many friends, and didn't bother me. And to this day, I was a loner, very much. But I knew that uh, there was a whole world out for me, and that's what started. And then I believed in myself. I believed I, anything I wanted to do, I could do. And there's just, I don't know where it comes from. And that's, I think, when people ask, where did you get the chutzpah? You're born with it. And if you believe in yourself, you can do anything. And my poor sister, <laughs> And my husband afterwards, you know. And uh, it's just, I have to be accepted for what I am, period. And most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. But it doesn't matter. It always, got, it always works out. And that's where the positive attitude is. I get up every morning and I say, to this day, this is going to be the best day of my life. I will not let anything negative come into my life. And I think that's the reason I ra we raise the kids that way we do. That anything you want to do, you can do. It's, I suppose, being a free spirit. That's the reason that I am the Indiana Jones. With, after I left show business and we got married, that's the next stage. Well, wait, hold on. Let, don't brush over that. Um, so I'm just talking. I don't know no, 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 what to make sense or no, whatever. It's wonderful. Um, really wonderful. Um, but I don't want to miss over a very important moment. What? And that is... You mentioned before I made you go off on another tangent mm -hmm. that you had just met this man when you guys were touring, um, and then what happened? And, and 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 if you could also put it in context of had all three singles come out, and and where were you guys at as 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 a band too? So there's like the personal and the professional combining right there. Okay, we're talking about. Um our career, doing the record sessions and so forth, we never really had, uh, we never really had a mentor. Everything, even when, uh, uh, when Meryl and Coffin managed us, uh, we did most of these things uh, on our own. We, uh, and I got all the jobs for us, you know, for us, because before we had a record contract, that we were able to, um, we had the experience of, of getting work for ourselves. We never, we, were, we, we didn't have the luxury that most acts have today. Even in those days, they had a manager that booked their acts. I did our own booking. I was our manager. And, and, I tr and Lynn was the one, that, the talent. So between, I managed the Burton sisters and Lynn created. That was, a, and that's why there was never, ever any jealousies between us. So that's the part of it. And that was a segment of our, we had 11 years in the business. So near. So what, at what point did you meet the man who was about to Well, your husband? my husband, Jim Shipley. When uh, he came back to Cleveland after being in the Coast Guard, and uh, he uh, booked us, uh, showed his father the pictures, and uh, I was not very happy with him because I said, I don't want to... We came to do a disc jockey tour. I don't want to... We have to get up early in the morning, go to bed late. I don't want to do a freebie. They're going to pay us for it. And I said, and it's ridiculous. Why aren't we being paid for it? But our manager said, yes, you better do it because it's good PR. So I'll never forget. Uh, so Jim met us for breakfast uh, at uh, one of the uh, radios. Uh, it's one of the, I think it was Bill Gordon's radio show. And he took us for breakfast before. And I was absolutely... I was not very nice. We have to just stop for one second. Oh. Yeah, we'll probably ring for a sec. Just because the audio. You're doing great. 
No, no, this, this is, I'm giving you segments. Um, I'm not, it's a funny thing, I'm not articulate. Yes, you are. Uh, I, no, I know, well, what, I, know, well, I mean, to be able to tell a story straight. My but mind goes there's, there's, in so many different, I'm multitasking. The, 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 main, the main part of this is to get down what you want to get down about all this stuff. So, and we're doing that completely. And to be very honest with you, I'm sitting here loving what I'm learning because I'm learning things from your eyes that um, that only that, that aren't even in history books. You know, the experiences that you had in that it. period of time was so quintessential um, to music history. There wasn't it wasn't like it was written about like you know today, uh, you know, an artist sings on the street corner and eighty people. Uh, put it on their blogs and and er back in those days, you know, there was very little recording that was done. There was very little photography that was done. Nothing was done, especially right. live photography. Right. So there's very little um, that you know, and a lot of these stories you're telling are, are, are bringing back. It's almost like ghosts that have been lost that it need to be recorded. This is exactly what we're doing. See, this. that's the reason I was always wondering why are you doing this? Is it? It's not just the history of Yiddish theater. Everyone knows that, but. To me, what's you fascinate me because of your your interest and your caring and wanting to know. I'm a dinosaur. I shouldn't be in this world right now because I don't. I've lived so many different lives and everything. No one sits and talks that we were doing. To me, a one and one is maybe it's because I'm the loner that I am. I am much more comfortable and happier doing a one and one because I want to know. Uh, but other people as well. So what you're telling me, and I'm curious, I said, why am I here? You know, this is really crazy why I'm here. I never even thought about it. Because my sister wanted me to come in and to revive the Burton sisters, like we'll never we'll keep going in on. But what you're doing is absolutely amazing. This is what's exciting to me. And, and I fell with my sister. You know, she still blows me away being as talented as, as she is. And she doesn't think she is. She doesn't believe, I believe in her more than she believes in her, so what can I, but getting back to our history, okay, yes. because there are other segments. So anyway, getting back to... Uh, you, were, you, were, you were unhappy with doing the oh, what, no, gig, but I didn't want to do it. He went into this little restaurant, and I was, I was nasty to Jim, because I was so barragous, and I said, why are we doing this? And then Lynn kicked me under the table. She said, be nice. This is, his father is... Uh, Mainline, and he'll promote our records and RCA. I was so nice that after we did the show, and we were, I felt pretty good, uh, that he invited, uh, took me out, took, uh, he got, uh, he got someone, uh, one of his friends, to be Lynn State, and then we went to this little Corman's back room, this little. Um, it was, a, it was not a speakeasy, but it was a, a hangout, you know, where all where the musicians were there. And uh, I was so nice to him because what I did, I interviewed him. I said, okay, tell me about you. You know, that was my first question to Jim. Tell me, who are you? And I loved doing it. And he just opened up and told me all about his life. And uh, that, and uh, gosh, we were out there. We were there for a couple of hours. And he says, who's taking you to the airport? So I said, uh, we'll probably take a cab. He said, no, no, I'll pick you up. So we were doing, we were in some gymnasium with this Bill Randall, who was the top disc jockey all over the country. And then, so Jim was there, picked us up. And to this day, I don't know whether he purposely made us, we missed the plane by five minutes. And I said, tell me today, after being married uh, 55 years, he says, no, that's a secret you'll never know. So we missed our plane. We missed our gig in, um, in Boston. I managed, they were hysterical with us. And then I said, okay, then after that, when the phone bill at that time was $125 a month, he said, I gotta marry this girl. And he, that's when we went to Buffalo, he followed us. He didn't tell us, what, uh, he was in the advertising agency, he had his own agency, and suddenly he had to be in Montreal. And then, because, but he would never say, but he follows around. But then the last thing he did, he says, okay, I'll take you to the Borscht Belt, because we had uh, a weekend at the Borscht Belt. And this was a momentous part of our life. And 
he spent three days and he just couldn't. He says, I'm never ever doing this again. And he says, this is, and then Lynn said, yep, Jim, this is the last time we're going to do the Borscht Belt. And he said to me, you, you have to marry me. And I said, not really ready to get married, not quite yet. But then when I came back to Philadelphia and I got a Dear John letter, marry me now or that's it, the bottom line, or I'm going on with my life. And I looked at Lynn and she looked at me. So I said, she says, you know, you're not getting any younger. Of course, at that age, uh, you know, and we've had a very successful career. I said, but you know, we're just really making it in the business. So I said, well, I suppose it's time. And I said, what are you going to do? She says, don't worry about me. That was our relationship. And then she went on to show business by herself. And then uh, six months later, we were married. And uh, that's what uh, moved to Cleveland. I said, what am I doing in Cleveland? Oh my God, Cleveland, Ohio, and Shaker Heights. I mean, these are all the Goyim, for goodness sake. This is my way of life. And being away from my sister, you know, because we were like two peas in a pod for 11 years. And it was a strange, strange feeling. And um, it was a very, uh, uh, it was an affluent life, but something that, um, we ne I never, money never meant anything to me at all. You know, I never, I just, uh, uh, just like to live comfortably in period. And of course, um, we decided uh, early in our marriage that we wanted to have a big family. And uh, we have now uh, two boys, two girls, two blondes, two brunettes, 14 months apart. And uh, it was by shared. It was just a matter of, and then we built a house in the country, which we called Kibbutz Shipley. And that goes to the next segment of my life. So where do we go from here? Well, um, so there are so many segments, and I can I'll go on for hours, but just stop me there. I mean, Lena, I'm just touching. She's laughing. You've heard these things. Why are you laughing? Don't look at me for you. No, I'm so, I'm just talking to you. <laughs> okay, so I guess the questions I have for you before we leave this segment is. Uh, tell oh, us, we're still in this segment. Just okay. Little, just a couple more minutes. Is uh, tell us maybe a little bit about your wedding, and then tell us, um, you know, how was living Jewishly in the goyish part of Cleveland for you? That wasn't easy. That wasn't so, easy. Let's, let's start well, with mother, we had a small wedding, fifty people, just the family at the the Acadia Hotel uh, in uh, in Philadelphia, uh, very modest wedding. And uh, then uh, after that, the hardest thing, and I remember to this day, is, is that I um, walked down the aisle, it was in a hotel, and there was a chuppah, and uh, when Lynn, uh, I said goodbye to Lynn, and I looked at Lynn, and then uh, my father brought me down the aisle, and I said, oh my God, I'm, le I'm leaving my life, what am I doing now? And uh, I said, oh my God, it was, that was a shocker. I think that was the most shocking part of my life is leaving not just the business, my sister. Because it, when you live with someone 24 hours a day, you work with someone and you both have the same goals together. And uh, it's just, it's like being twins, more or less. And then after that, it was a lovely wedding. And um, then of course I went on a month's honeymoon. My husband had to take me into Hunts Month's to the Virgin Islands, to St. Thomas, and uh, to uh, St. Thomas in Jamaica, and uh, to, uh, we were supposed to go to, to Cuba and so forth. It was a, it was my, nothing was too good for me. What am I doing, uh, living that kind of a, it wasn't even a, a wealthy life, and I never did. I worked, we worked hard our entire life, and we never took anything for granted. And the shock was going from a, um, a show business world, as we did, to living uh, modestly, working modestly, and going to Kibbutz Shipley, you know, where it was one in a month's honeymoon, and then got married and uh, bought a little house in Shaker Heights, and then we decided, and Jim's a country boy, he always loved the country, and uh, his family had uh, a little, uh, they had a home in the country, and, and also, 
uh, with a, uh, a lovely attachment, and so we used to go there on weekends, and we both decided we wanted to live in the country. And uh, that's when we bought seven acres, and we decided to raise our kids as country kids. And so we really, and the piece that we bought seven acres, and it was, we're the only Jews to crack the line, because no Jews were allowed, it's Hunting Valley, come on, this is a different world. But it was uh, the whole thing, that was the exciting part, just building, not just getting married, having kids as close as we did. We formed our own, um, our, our own little kibbutz. It was a way of life for us. And then I'll never forget on my 40th birthday, my husband had to give me, gave me a little, little box. And he also, with, with the card, uh, on your 40th birthday, we're building a little lake for you, Lake Row. You know, these are things that, uh, that was shocking to me to go from one world to another. We're living, meager, not, we always lived nicely. We lived with what we can afford. And also, but we decided that, uh, that we wanted to live this kind of a life. And we always brought kids in from, they went to a country school, but uh, three, four times a week, they'd send, we'd take them, Jim would pick them up and take them to a Hebrew school because we wanted them to, re to be, to appreciate who they were. And to, because when we lived, where we lived, there were no Jews. And we wanted them to have the, to, the Yiddishkeit, to feel that, uh, as Jews, how important it was. And so they went to, and the kids had a very long day. They went to school, picked them up, and they didn't get back until 7 o'clock at night. If there were no Jews, where was there a Hebrew school? It was in Hunting Valley, was in Chagrin Falls. That's where we lived. That's where we had. But in Beechwood, then they had the Hebrew schools. They had uh, day schools and they had classes in, in Hebrew. And there was a very big affluent Jewish community in Cleveland, but not where we lived, that was just it. So this is all, and so therefore we were able to have, uh, they would go to learn Hebrew and to know all the holidays and stuff. Unfortunately, I think what I missed a lot was my mother and father because uh, my mother passed away a year after we got married, you know, and uh, uh, so I miss the, the, the feeling of being surrounded by a family, and especially my mother. To this day, I can't even think of my mother without crying. You know, it's just certain things that just hit you in life. It's a nice sentimentality in my life, the things that really grab me. But it's just, it's just a matter of, but it's being detached from not only show business, but detached from family life that we had the Goldmans were always together. And then having uh, my parents, you know, uh, passed to my father did it years later, and having to live a very Gentile business life in, uh, in Cleveland. So before, when I first got married, after we came back from our honeymoon, that was a shocker. I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know how to do anything. I, I, and they brought me in this cute little house in Shaker Heights and, uh, uh, had breakfast and Jim left me and I said, what do I do? So I said, I'm going to make dinner. And of course, my mother-in-law filled the freezer with, she, she did the decor, the decor, she did everything with the house, which was lovely. And uh, I said, I'm going to make lamb chops. What did I know about lamb chops? Jim walked in and the house was practically on fire. I tried to make dinner and it was a disaster. He says, I'll do the cooking from here on out. And then, but I was lucky enough I had a neighbor this, uh, whose mother was a, um, a caterer. And uh, she came in the next day and she said, you're never gonna burn anything again. I'm gonna teach you how to bake. So she came in with this beautiful cake. And then she, she said, you, and I love to bake. And that's the reason I make my mandel bread that I make now, which everyone seems to love. Baking, I love to do. I don't particularly care to cook. And then after that, so that was, we were there for around four or five years. By that time, um, I, had, uh, I had Jan, my neighbor, who was able to teach me how to cook and to bake and so forth. And I said, what am I going to do with my life? You know, Jim went to work. And that was a big shocker, going for a very active life that I had for so many years, and then just being a housewife. How am I gonna be a house for her? This wasn't a part of my life. But my mother-in-law had a, well, they, uh, 
my father-in-law was very active in the Jewish community, and uh, they had a circle of Jewish friends and so forth. And one of their friends had a, uh, a daughter who was very active with the blind. Uh, in, uh, so I got involved, so I used to work for the blind. I went there once a week and uh, do very outrageous things with them, and I used to sing with them, and had holidays with them, and so forth. And then when my mother, the year after I got married, my mother passed away, and uh, she had lost half of her hearing. And I wanted to do something in her memory. I said, and there was a speech and hearing center in Philadelphia, in, uh, in Cleveland. So um, I didn't know the community well. So I went to my father-in-law, because he was so active. I said, give me a list of the, uh, the live ones, the liveies where I can get money from. I want to go and raise money for the speech and hearing center. So what he did, gave me a list. And of course, being in show business, it was very easy for me to walk into an office and say, this is what I have, and this is how much money I need, and so forth. And they needed a skin uh, testing machine for babies. And um, I wanted to have a memorial for my mother. So uh, I said, uh, what does it cost? And they said, uh, $50,000. And where was I going to get $50,000? So when I got a list from uh, the entrepreneurs and the people that gave the philanthropists in, in Cleveland, there was a very big community. Um, uh, oh, yes, the reason I was able to uh, raise the money is that the editor of the uh, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Dealer he uh, had a, uh, a daughter who had lost uh, her hearing. And uh, he, uh, one of the trips that he came in, he was on a plane, he came uh, uh, to the airport, and something happened, he lost his hearing temporarily. So he was very interested in uh, the Speech and Hearing Center. So I, Chutzpah me, I went to see him, and I said, I have to raise this, this money. So I said, so he wrote a story about um, Tilly Goldman, which was my mother. I wanted to have a room for Tilly Goldman to the Speech and Hearing Center. So of course, I always know you have to have documentation, you have to prove what you're doing. So they had a picture of me with, uh, uh, with the hearing, this, and I realized, I said, well, how much money do I have to raise? They said, if you can raise $25,000, you can get a matching fund from at the time it was Woolworth. So I was able to raise $25,000. And at that time, we're talking 1955. And uh, so I really felt that I wasn't, I was doing something. Uh, and I wanted to, so now to this day in Cleveland, there is a room at the Speech and Hearing Center for Tilly Goldman, for my mother. And uh, so I always, and I did with the, until I start having kids. So I, I work with the blind, and then I always, and I tried to take a course of art, but I, I had all my friends who were really artists, and I wasn't, and that didn't do very well. You know, so I really didn't care. But life was always, every day was a day for me. I always wanted to do something productive. And I think that's pretty much the story of my life right now, which it continues. So that was, uh, so I had, didn't have a hard time uh, going into this once again. There was a Jewish community, which my husband was uh, working with Federation, and he was also a fundraiser. So that was part of my, my life as a Jew, which was that even though we lived uh, with the Gentiles in the other, in the other, we're two different worlds, what can I tell you? And uh, the, the exciting thing about, this is where Israel came into my life, and that's another segment. Uh, it was in 1968. This was after the Six Day War. And um, where were you living at that point? In uh, in Cleveland. I was living in uh, in Cleveland. I had married. I have my kids. I had four kids at the time. And uh, uh, I just uh, Jim said, you know, uh, I would uh, I won a trip to Greece because there was a, RCA had, uh, he was working with, um, with RCA at the time uh, for Mainline, that was the, the founding. And Jim himself had his own television show, uh, uh, which I'll tell you about later. But he said, you know, he said, uh, I want a trip to Greece. And this is when uh, Johnson was president. 
And uh, that's what he said. Don't take any trips out of the country. Uh, you have to stay. You can have your trip in the United States. Well, he won, won this trip to Greece. And uh, I said, Greece, here's a map. Israel is right across from Greece. I said, I won't go to Greece unless I go to Israel. So, and I was so excited. I was going to finally go to Israel. So Jeff comes home one night, and uh, I was in the tub, and he comes and he says, the trip was canceled because we can't go to Greece. I didn't care about that. I cared about Israel. So he looked at me, and he said, it was either the price of a divorce or taking my wife to Israel. So that's when, so we took the trip to Israel. And one little thing about Jim was this, with, I come from a rather talented family. Uh, he was a star in radio in uh, Philadelphia, WCAU in Philadelphia. And uh, he was a very fine actor. And that was something that he, and he was a writer. So um, he decided that, um, let me see, I don't want this to go too long, but uh, uh, Jim um, had the opportunity, he decided he was to take me to Israel. We had no idea uh, where to go. We didn't want to go on a, we didn't go on a mission. We had to go by ourselves. But before that, uh, there was the first, after the Six Day War, they had one of the top Israeli shows that went all over the country. And they came to the Hannah Theater in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia, in, the, um, in Cleveland, rather. Please edit some of this stuff, because I'm, I'm babbling on and on and on. So anyway, uh, so um, he, and at that time, I was studying some Hebrew, and I had this wonderful Syriac Abbasi, she was from Israel, and she said, we're having this first Israeli production coming to the Hannah Theater. Would you, uh, uh, do you want to go to see the show? I said, of course. And then, uh, then she came to me and she says, we have a problem, because they're booked at this hotel, and this was a cast, uh, this was the stars of uh, like Michael Bornstein, Epesa Dicka Bornstein, some of the top Israeli stars were in this first show. And uh, they had no place to stay because their rooms were canceled or something. So I said, well, come to Kuba Chifley. So we brought the entire cast. Our house has always been open to everyone. Some, some, and we had a rather large home in the country. And uh, we brought all the acts there and we became very, very, very friendly with them and that's when I said that's when right before that's when, when we went to Israel to right before going to Israel so all of the one incident one part of it always seemed to lead into the other part of our life and that's the way life has always been so getting back to um, our trip to Israel um, uh, before that we had this uh, uh, we had this show that came and this I think will be very very important let me just see how this really, I'm trying to go back so many years in our career, in our different lives. Uh, when, so we took our trip to Israel and uh, it was an amazing. We spent seven days there. And the last day we walked into a gallery in Tel Aviv. It was the Lynn Gallery and this beautiful woman said, you know, I'm doing the first Israeli art show in, uh, in Cleveland. And it so happened it was at our temple. So she said, uh, will you come to the show? I said, of course. So we came in. So Amalia Abel. Uh, so we, I set up the show, and it so happened it was at our temple. That's another thing with my life, but I shared. I ended up being chairman of the show because the rabbi's wife was in the hospital, and what do I know about art? I'm not a pseudo-art collector, but I know how to promote art. So in three days, uh, we invited the entire community, and she walked away with, at that time, $55,000. At that time, we're talking 1968. 1969, uh, because I promoted it once again, my experience in show business. That's what I do for a living. I can promote things. And uh, it was very successful. And uh, the next, uh, next year, she became very, very close with us. And she said, I want to bring the art of the Kuput seams to, uh, to Cleveland. So she brought this top artist in the show. 
and uh, only raised forty-two thousand dollars. And then uh, Nachum Marbel said, "You know, um, Rachel and Jim. Uh, oh, oh, are you going to Israel next month? Uh, why don't you meet me in Brussels, uh, where I have an art show, and then I'll spend five days." Uh, in the country. I'll take you to the Sinai, I'll take you to all the artist colonies. So how do you say no to something like this? So it was wonderful. So we were excited. So we get to Brussels and I look at my watch and I said, Nahum, I said, we're late. He said, my show was canceled. I said, what? He said, because Menachem Begin is speaking in Brussels. I said, Menachem who? What did I know about Begin and Israeli politics? So anyway, I spent, we spent 24 hours, you know, we saw the city, and then we decided to, then when we were about to board the plane, uh, we were up to first class because we had an opportunity. And I came on the plane, and uh, I saw, I found out who Menachem Begin was. Menachem Begin was the leader of the, the opposition uh, party. At that time, Ben Gurion, uh, they were the Labor Party had uh, most of the controlled Israel, and I uh, saw this very distinguished elderly man right in front of all the magazines, and I had just started learning Hebrew. I had like five words in Hebrew, so I picked up a Hebrew newspaper, and Begin took off his spectacles and said, "Tell me, my dear, do you speak Hebrew?" I said, "Kitzat," one of five words that I knew. He said. Sit down, talk to me. So I spent eight hours in the plane with Begin, and he never talked politics. But what he talked about, when he found, he said, what do you do? And I told him about the family. I was in Yiddish theater. He was fascinated with Yiddish theater because he came from Poland, and he loved Yiddish. It was the most important thing. So anyway, uh, right before we were landing, he says, what are you doing? What are you and Jimmy doing Saturday? Why don't you come to my house? He's meet my wife, and I have friends coming over uh, for after Shabbat. So Jim, and he gave us his card. So Jim said, he does it to everybody. We're not going to say, no, he invited us to come. So after we went into the desert and we came back uh, to the Sheridan, and then I said, well, call Begin. It's Saturday. So he, had, and this is the strangest thing in Israel at that time. Uh, he gave Begin's number to the operator. And this was like a four o'clock in the afternoon. And she says, that's Begin's phone number. It's Shabbat, he doesn't answer the phone until seven o'clock at night. And then finally, Jim called him and he invited us over. And uh, it was the same little apartment that when he, he was the head of the Irgun and he was his whole, but that's, it had seven exits in this little apartment in number one, Rosenbaum Street, and uh, met his wife, and they had a of these very wealthy women that came from South America and so forth, and I would, I went into the kitchen with Elisa Began, and I washed little schnapps glasses and so forth, and I served, and she says, uh, after they left, she says, Raquel, you're different than them. Why don't you come, to, what are you doing tomorrow? Come to the house, while I'm cleaning the house, have a cup of coffee with me. So anyway, uh, and bring Jim. So that's when we came to the house, and that's what started the love affair between the Beggins and the Shipleys. And then when they used to come into New York, and he was with Bonds and so forth, because he was still the leader of the opposition, so Ala would call me, Elisa would call me, Rachel, meet me in New York. So I met them in New York, and I go shopping with her. And uh, then uh, I would sit with Begin, I said, you know, Menachem, one day you'll be prime minister. And he said, Rachel, Be'ezrat Hashem, with the help of God. And lo and behold, in 77, he was prime minister. And uh, by that time, uh, uh, by that time, we had moved from Cleveland to Orlando. And this was in 19, my goodness, it was in 1975 when we moved to Orlando. And uh, then uh, uh, I would, uh, then in 1979, uh, the kids were getting older, and they were doing very well. And uh, what we did, which I think was the best investment we ever did in our lives, we wanted the kids to go to Israel. So we sent all four of them, 
to Israel when they were 16. They went together to a camp. And then uh, several years later, we sent them to study for one year. There was a Machon program, which is in Mount Scopus. Kids from the left, the right, and the middle, you know, politically, they would learn Hebrew, and each one of the kids would uh, go there for a year, and then they would uh, love the country. They don't have to live in Israel as long as they love the country and being proud that they're Jewish. And that's what, so through the years, it became a part of the kids' life as well. It wasn't just going to Hebrew school, but they really became Jews in every, and that's why Yiddish in theater and being a Jew, more than, and seeing how it led to Israel. And each one of my kids have a passion for Israel. It's like the door of the door from generation to generation. And uh, that's the reason we have four good kids that uh, love who they are and they love being Jews. And each one of them are a story within themselves. So that's pretty much uh, continuing with Begin after in, when he became prime minister uh, in, in 77. And then what I did uh, while the kids were growing up, I knew I had to do something besides volunteer work. So I uh, started to come, I said to Jim, what can I do in Orlando? So he said, either tourism or real estate. I said, I don't do things. I said, tourism. So I was one of two companies that handled all the conventions that came into town. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew how to contact the presidents of the company, and we did, I did very unusual things with my company. And that was the time that I really became a businesswoman from 79 to 83. And that was another chapter in my life. It keeps to go from one chapter. I do something, it's the end. And I start with something else. Different, uh, different chapters in my life are different. So that's, uh, what was I gonna say? So that's the business end. Shall I continue with the... Oh, you go. I have a question about the idea of Yiddish, because Menach Megan responds to Yiddish theater, yeah. he responds to the Yiddish language. It's the song, it's the storytelling. Can you tell us about what do you think it's about the language, the sound? And the difference tell between... Us, it's funny, and, and, I was, and I was gonna ask if you could talk a little more about the Yiddish theater, which you haven't done really yet. Okay. What is it about Yiddish? <sighs> Yiddish is from here. I'll tell you the difference. I play with seven languages, okay. Oh, that's another part of my life. Uh, I love the sound of Yiddish. Like in Hebrew, you would say, I speak Yiddish. Ani bedeber, ani ivrit. Yiddish, ich kann reden Yiddish. There's a feeling with that as a language, which is, it's, it's, so, it's so different. And uh, it's, it was so much a part of me, I would suppose. And anyone that's ever, that came from Poland and came from Europe, what, which bound that it put us together as a, we're a peoplehood, that's what we are. And Yiddish is a part of us. And what keeps the Jews together is Yiddish. Because everywhere in the world, you'll find Yiddish spoken. And now it's come back again, more than Hebrew. It's, it's a different, it's, it puts you into where we were uh, before we had Israel. We were a, uh, we were the wandering Jews. We didn't have any place. There was no place for us, uh, for us. And that's the reason after, in, after 1492, we scattered after uh, we were thrown out of Spain, uh, we, most of them went to Europe and they went to Germany, and they went to Poland. Yiddish is a potpourri of German, as well as, uh, and Polish. So there's so much of the similar. So Yiddish is, the same alphabet is Yiddish. Uh, they use the same alphabet. Yiddish and Hebrew use the same alphabet. The difference is they have the little, the kudats, the dots, and so forth. It's spoken differently, but it's the same alphabet. Hebrew is Aramaic. Yiddish comes from the, uh, from Europe, and that was uh, you. You really can't speak Hebrew the feeling as you can. That's why Yiddish humor is so important. That's why every comedian, in the in anywhere, they have this tremendous. Uh, there's always Yiddish words, and it's become it's it's a part of America of anywhere you know, and I think that's the reason. And there's a certain. There's a soul with Yiddish. I shouldn't say that. It is it's, it's, with Hebrew. You've got it. It's a tough. It is the language of our people. 
but Yiddish is something that uh, is that uh, that binds us all together, and that's the reason to this day, like on a Friday night, uh, I the I make Friday night. Uh, I love Friday night dinner. I make my chicken soup, my matzo balls, and all the Yiddish things that my mother used to make, and uh, and what I do is I play all Yiddish music. I play not just the Burton Sisters, I play and see Marilzai, Moisha Oisha, and I have a tremendous collection of, of Yiddish music. And uh, it, it does something there, and that it puts me in the mood. And I feel Yiddish, to me, Friday night and Friday and Saturday are the most important thing. When we came back, our, last, our first trip to Israel, we had this wonderful guide, uh, who uh, Adi Benor, who was uh, the pilot for Ben Gurion during the Second World War, and uh, he was, and uh, he became, he was involved with the Jewish National Fund and so forth, and uh, he, uh, we became very friendly with him, and the last night he invited us to his house for Shabbat dinner, and I'll never forget he had three of his daughters there, and they went through, uh, not just. Yiddish, they went through the prayer over the wine and uh, and washing of the hands and uh, lighting the candles and it puts you into your own your own little world and to this day uh, that's what we have we invite people over for Friday for Shabbat and that's when the uh, I I'm the Yiddish housewife what can I tell you I forget about the business I'm surrounded by Yiddish music and I uh, it's it's food and the atmosphere and we invite a lot of time. Uh, our business people and Gentile people uh, over, and we explain what we are. We are a peoplehood. When we lost the second, we lost the second temple. Uh, where would you go? So we created our, to this day. We created our own communities, where we had every community has a shul or a temple. There is a Hebrew school. Uh, there is federation. You have this every place in the world, and this what this is what our this is what we will we will be there forever. There will always be there will always be Jews, and that's the and being being a proud Jew has always been a very important part of my life. But meeting Begin and being a part of Israel, so I had two hats. One was being an American Jew. And then, and literally being an Israeli, and when I started my own company, Leisure Planners, uh, it was it was very successful. So I would go back and forth every year to Israel, and uh, that's when uh, I got involved with Israeli politics. Uh, I helped Begin in his first election because I was an American Jew, you know, and I was able to. PR has been the story of my life. It's easy. It's very easy for me. Was he a good guy to work with? Honestly? One, oh, he was wonderful. He's absolutely wonderful. He was brilliant. And, uh, and then uh, uh, I used to go there every time we sent our kids to Israel. So I was, my son Tom was in the Israeli army for a year. And all of our kids have a, a, a tremendous attachment to the country. And through the years, with the, uh, in 1983, after Begin resigned, that was after the first Lebanese war, when Begin resigned and Yitzhak Shamir became prime minister, um, my son was in the Israeli army at the time. And uh, uh, I got a call from the PM's office because they all knew that I was an expert with convention planning because of my company, Leisure Planners. And they said, Rachel, would you come to Israel for a year to help us with the Jerusalem Economic Conference? because you had the heads of states and you had people in business and so forth. So um, I looked at Jim and I said, uh, can I go? You know. So at that time I had a son studying on the Mahon program, on a special program. My daughter Tracy was an artist and she was studying on the, uh, in the Negev and my son was in the army. So I had three of my kids at Israel at one time. And one thing when Jim met me, he knew that he'd never clipped my wings. I always ask permission. Anything I do, can I go? How does he say no when things are? So that's the, been our relationship through the years. So therefore, uh, going to uh, Israel, and that, so in a way, my heart and soul is in Israel, and I'm living as a Jew here. And it's a very hard, it's a very, I have two loyalties, but being a Jew is my first. 
but I feel so, I feel more at home in Israel because I'm a majority. This is my people. And here, and I love being here, and I love living in this. But if I had my brothers, I would be living in Israel because that's where my, that's where my soul is. And it's hard for, it, it, it's hard to even explain, you know, but uh, this is uh, something that's been uh, uh, a part of uh, my whole life. Does that answer your questions? Um, I, we, um, We're running out of time. We're keep we are, doing this. But, but there's a couple of questions I have. Um, one, I just have to ask, did you talk to Begin during the whole peace talks and things? I oh, mean, what happened with Begin was, um, I got a call uh, when he was in Camp David. Uh, uh, Elisa Allah called me from uh, from Camp David, and uh, uh, I said. So we had this long conversation, and she said, uh, "I hate to say, almost like being a prisoner there. We're, we we just have to come with an agreement. I don't know wh how much we want there. I don't want too much of this. It's politically, and I'd rather not say about that. But I'm talking to you without cameras. And she says, uh, unless we, that we, uh, she couldn't stand Carter. They couldn't. He was more for, uh, uh, for the, uh, for Sadat. They had that relationship, and uh, he was literally almost forced into." signing the agreement, but Begin said he was always for the country first. It had to be the country he first. He was happy. What? what uh, he oh, was happy. oh, yeah, he signed it, that's right. He didn't like the terms. He didn't want the Sinai, and Sadat didn't want the Sinai, but we were stuck with the Sinai. We didn't need it. That was, that was something, don't give us the Sinai. Give us greater Israel, which is ours, but don't give us the Sinai. And that, that's, that's, I think that's the question. And then for one year afterwards, uh, the uh, the FBI would contact us. We they would we would they would call. For us. This is crazy. They would leave. They would hang up for some reason. So we know that the FBI was after us for one year after uh, after that, which is crazy. That's crazy. I mean, it's you crazy. Had a crazy. Oh, life. it's. it's it goes on with China and everything. This is just the beginning, but I don't want to take up all of your well, time. Let me ask you a question. Um, we should, we, we should, um, how much more time do we have on this roll? So okay, time. great. So how about if we wrap up for the next five or ten minutes? Yeah, why don't, look, why don't. Let's, let's talk about whatever else you wanted to talk about. Let's talk about China a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And let's talk about what other things, if, if, if we got five or ten minutes before we got your sister on the hot seat. Okay, because I really, I, I, but it's I'm saying, I'm saying. have a book inside of you. Yeah, I just, it, it's, it's just, wonderful. but you know what happened, it really was interesting, I'm losing my time and my days, because I lived so, I lived every segment of my life uh, to its fullest, and it was in compartments. So, so, Everything. So, 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 All right. So tell you about. It. Okay. So anyway. So, so anyway, with with Jake, Israel, China, with it. Okay. Okay. It? So what happened was that after I did the uh, Jerusalem Econ I did the Jerusalem Economic Conference. In the meantime, Jim would come back and forth and so forth. So it was in like it just, and I had one daughter who was in L.A. She was uh, an actress and so forth. So we always had the families together, and uh, the one country that totally fascinated me was Taiwan. And they had the heads, and I got very. And I said, you know, I'm going to, uh, I want to learn Chinese, and I want to go into business. I want to go into international trade, because I was very involved with the the business community with the Jerusalem Conference. I knew them all, and uh, and I said, I met now the delegation from Taiwan. What do I know the difference between Taiwan and China? To me, it's Chinese. So therefore, I understood how to do business with the, Chi with the, I'm sorry, with the Chinese. So when, they, when I came back, I said, Jim, I said, I want to start a, a company uh, with, I sold my business, Leisure Planners, and I said, I'd like to go into international because Israel's got the brains, China's got the people, and I, and I know how to put them together. So that's when I started our company, uh, which is Trading Wise. This goes on for many, many years. But it was always one part of my life went into the other. And it's just that one, I would say one part prepared me for the next part of my life, if that makes any sense. And that's when uh, we started. In the meantime, Jim sold his radio stations and he went to, uh, 
after selling his radio, he said he went into advertising. And I said, you know, Jim, it's crazy. I said, you have all this talent. Why don't we go into business together? And that's what we've been doing for the past uh, 15 years. And uh, that's what we're, we have a major company uh, in, in Cleveland, not in Cleveland, in Orlando rather. And uh, uh, we still have uh, uh, an international round table, which I'll, I'll talk to you about that later. But I've always loved languages. So during, I never have a dull moment. Uh, through when I met different people business-wise. Uh, so I studied Chinese, I'm still studying Chinese. I had French when I was in show business, Spanish, Jim and I are studying now, a little bit of Russian, a little bit of um, uh, Japanese, uh, Yiddish is very close to German. I can go any of the, I'm not the ugly American. I can go in any of the, anywhere in Chinese, ni hao, shenti hao ma, or come on sa va, or you know, say, I can go into any language, and this is the reason I'm the Indiana Jones. That's the reason I'm comfortable anywhere in the world. And uh, this is what gives me, I suppose, the joie de vivre that they say I have, is that every day is another day. And it's, it's the people, people make it. If you don't have the language, you don't have the people. The way to get to anybody, I found this reason why we're rather successful what we do is because uh, when we meet people, having the knowledge of a language and understanding the customs and the culture, and this is the reason that uh, uh, I'm able to, uh, to go from one country to another and be able to bring uh, people together. After I came back from, uh, uh, I'm the China lady in Orlando. I brought the, the uh, I brought, I studied Chinese for many years. Uh, in Orlando, uh, they we had this. Uh, they wanted to have sister cities uh, all over the world, and the one sister city was China. They want, and of course, uh, in nineteen okay, in nineteen eighty six, eighty five, eighty six, uh, because of my background with uh, with Chinese, when a major Chinese delegation came to Orlando. Uh, and I had some Chinese, so I became very friendly with them. And uh, oh, this is the f this is the funniest story of them all. I came back from Israel. I'm recalling these things in 1984. I was in Israel from 1983 to 84. I came back to uh, to Orlando, and uh, I got a call from the USIA in Washington because my company, Leisure Planners, we had 52 languages. We had it, but they had no language. And they said, Rachel. Uh, we know you sold the company, but do you have Chinese? I said, sure. So they said, we had the most important Chinese delegation coming to uh, Orlando. Uh, they would come to San Diego for a major conference. They're coming to Washington, and uh, we wanted them to come to Orlando. I said, no problem. They said, would you uh, take care of them? So Jim and I handled them for three days. It was very, very successful. They had the mayor of Shanghai, Duan, who did the long march with Mao Zedong, the head of the, the, the red flag newspaper. So I had all these friends. I didn't know where we were going with it. And um, then before, and the government sent two bodyguards. This was the first delegation that came to the States. And then the mayor of Shanghai said to the, uh, the interpreter, you tell Mrs. Shipley she comes tomorrow to teach us tourism. I started to laugh. I said, look, I just came back from Israel. I left my husband for one year. If I leave on one more day, he is going to divorce me. But send me a ticket in June. Uh, put me in the best language institute in Beijing, and you own me. So Jim laughed. He said, they don't give ice in the wintertime. You will never, ever get a, a, a ticket. I sent me economy class in June. I got a ticket, you were enrolled in the Beijing Language Institute in Beijing, and this is where you're studying, and pretty much we own you. And that's another, so I lived pretty much in a compound. No heat in the wintertime in Beijing. I was the only senior citizen there. They're all uh, kids from all over the world. So that was another segment of, uh, of Chinese, you know. And then when I came back, I decided to go into international trade. So that pretty much leads into, I know you're looking at me as I'm totally crazy. I can't but, believe your life. But, so, it's, it's just, and I don't Were know. You, did you stay connected with all these leaders? Of course. In China? Uh, yeah, of course. So you probably had access yeah, to Yeah, well, it th goes, oh, that goes, you have five, two more minutes, I'll tell you. Oh. I mean, it's two more minutes, because it, it's such a potpourri of so many things, and that's the reason I'm not articulate on the dates. There are too many things happening. But the interesting thing happened, 
since I was the China lady in Orlando, when anyone from China would start coming in, they'd always call me. And when uh, the mayor had the the mayor of Orlando had the mayor of uh, Guiling, which is city beautiful in in China, come to Orlando, and she had a big uh, reception for him, and he brought his wife, and. Uh, uh, I, she invited me, and I came, and uh, I got very friendly with his wife. And she said, you know, uh, Rachel, I want to study at UCF because I want to be able to enhance my English. So we became very, very close. So she helped me with my Chinese. I helped her with her, her English. And then, uh, for a, then she, we sponsored, Jim and I sponsored her. And then the following, a couple years later, she said, I want to bring my daughter. And Jim and I sponsored, we do everything as a team, you know, this, and sponsored the daughter. And we became very, very close. And then she came one day and she said, uh, I have a problem, but uh, my husband was just made the Chinese ambassador to North Korea in Pyongyang, and he wants me to come, but I'm worried about my daughter. I said, don't worry, I'll be her Jewish mother, I'll take care of her. So anyway, th she was there for three years, no, no communication at all. She came back and she said, uh, uh, we were like a family, and she said it was so successful. It was so successful that my husband was made the Secretary General of the People's Congress. And, and if I am a part of your company, and if I do Asian affairs, my husband will open up doors for you. And then that's when my company started to grow. That's when Jim and I were together. And then uh, I was back and forth to China. And then the first, I always, when I was in, the, when I uh, did the Jerusalem Economic Conference, I said to, uh, uh, I uh, got very friendly with, uh, a lot of the people there and the business people. And by that time, I'd been back to Israel 50 times, back and forth, so it was almost like half of my home, half of my home was there. And uh, uh, I got a call from ECI, which is the largest telecommunication company in, in Israel, and said, we know that uh, China started with China Telecom, a major, major uh, uh, telecommunication in Beijing. Do you think your wife's husband, who's a secretary general in the Great Hall, do you think that uh, he can uh, uh, open the door? So I told Chen Hua, she said, no problem, Mei Wenti, Mei Wenti, it's no problem. I said, what do you mean? She said, my, it's a school chum of my husband. My husband went to school with him. So that was my first major client that I had. So I was able to bring the delegation, and he did it, from Israel to China, and that was my first contract, three years on a retainer for three years with that. So, it's part of my life, you know, it's, it's, it keeps going and going. And a result of that, uh, Jim and I have something, you can see it on our website, it's the International Roundtable, because after we brought a delegation from Orlando to China, and then everyone said, you know, we want to meet the mayor, we want to meet the politicos in town. Uh, so we started a little international roundtable. It's been going on for 13 years. It's uh, now, it was in the Sun Trust for like 12 years, and we'd bring, once a month, we bring speakers, whether the head of Florida Hospital or the Arts Association, or uh, next one we have next week is uh, the Council General from Mexico. So, uh, and then it's been going on for so many years. And the certain things happen in your life. There is a uh, club in uh, in uh, in uh, Orlando that was only never open to the Jews. So therefore, it was a university club. So we had to find a home for our round table. So uh, called up, and now it's open to all the Jews, and we have a round table at the university club. So this it's it's so it's ironic things that things work out that way. So that's pretty much a little, and it keeps going and going. What that's amazing. I can't thank you enough. That is but the most I, I, amazing But honey, story. it has, it, it, I don't know what they, I'd like to tell you about my four kids, which are the most important in our life, each one of our kids. First of all, Robin is in LA. Rob, and she's coming to see, she's coming, you'll meet Robin, she's coming here. She's a, uh, uh, she's is a, uh, uh, a psychologist, a behavioral psychologist working with autism, with autistic kids. And she has her own company in LA. 
she started in show business and said that's enough for me and went right into uh, went into the university and her husband is uh, did all the graphic designers uh, designs for 24 for so many years doing that and then I have my daughter Tracy uh, who uh, is living in Jerusalem and uh, she has three grown-up kids and uh, she uh, this she divorced her husband and now she's with their kids in, in Israel. And my son, Tom, is a true entrepreneur. Hydroxetone, which is the top uh, skin thing in the country, that's the, he's the, he was in the Israeli army and then he's always been the entrepreneur in the family and he went into different businesses and, and now that's his company, New Jersey. And my son, Adam, is another one. He is in New Orleans and he, uh, he was there for 10 years. Tipitina's was, he did all the, he was the manager of Tipitina's with all the acts, and then he went to a Preservation Hall. He left Tipitina's, and now he's managing the top team in the, uh, the Soul Brothers, uh, and he now just came back from on team. So each one of our kids are like this, but the best thing about them, which I love, is they're very, they talk to each other once a, once a week, each one, whether Tracy's in Israel, and uh, we're having a, and Tracy remarried again, and she had her 50th birthday. So after we, uh, we come back from San Francisco, the whole family's gonna meet in New Jersey. We're gonna meet her husband, and then Adam finally found someone that I think we have a wedding within the next year. So it's gonna be a real favoringen with the whole family. And that's pretty much it. So our kids really, and Tom, is our business advisor. It's just a matter that everyone is so close. It's, uh, uh, it, life is good. And I said, you know something, uh, to have this, and I talked to Lynn, we laugh about it. I said, well, well, let me see. I'll look for the next 20 years. She said, 20 years? She says, I go from day to day. I said, no, 20 years ahead. There's, there are mountains to climb. There's so many things to do in life. And that's the story of my life, and it's enough about me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh.